I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. In this episode, we'll be focusing on creating scalable center of excellence or communities of engagement within an organization using the Power Platform. Today's guest is from Houston, Texas in the United States. He works as a senior manager, citizen development and COE at Baker Hughes. He's a digital transformation leader and catalyst focusing on talent, culture and governance for enterprise-wide adoption. You can find links to his bio in the show notes for this episode. Mohammed, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's good to have you on, and it's good to be able to unpack your story. But before we get started, I always like to talk a bit about the things that you do when you're not working. What, what is that for you when it comes to family, food, fun, hobbies? What are your interests that are not involving your career? Oh, uh, I love these questions. Kind of try to unpack there. So, at the family front, I I had I grew up as part of a big family. So, I have six sisters and three brothers. That I, I really, uh, you know, uh, they're just amazing. They, you know, growing together and learning from each other was fantastic. My parents did an amazing job raising us uh, as well. Um, my dad is actually the reason probably or maybe a major influence in my obsession with technology. So I remember in my childhood sitting next to him and he is like uh, programming and clipper, a programming language and compiler that do not exist today. And um, I would see him sometimes frustrated trying to fix things and I want to jump in and help. Um, Mind you, I didn't know how to read back then, but uh, this is where my obsession with technology started growing. and. uh, when I get to college, I ended up going with engineering rather than computer science. And um, I was trying to get the computer science route, but um, my dad was just, uh, and, and and quite frankly, uh, to his credit, he said, you know what, son, you didn't need to go there. I give you a PhD. You go do and learn something new. <laughs> so that's where the, the family component and how it uh, shaped who I am today in technology um, food, I love food. Food is food unite us. I, I mean, if you go anywhere, I mean, learning and seeing from these different cuisines. Um, I even enjoy um, the few times that I kind of try to learn cooking new things and stuff. It's so therapeutic, so nice to do. And it's um, also nice to see people enjoying what you cook. That too is it's just like has its own, you know, different uh you know, uh, joy. Uh, the one thing is that, um, just to be honest with myself, I'm not doing it that often. I need to get back into it. It's so good. Um, yeah. And for fun, um, there are two things mainly I would say, um, I love photography, um, specifically nature animals. So whenever time permit, um, I have membership at the zoo so i would go and enjoy the the weather and everything and take very nice pictures and sometimes i was i would sit and question myself as like why why didn't i publish these um just like you know for the people to see what i see and these fine details it's just fascinating you know every 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 animal has these amazing details um the other part of the fun is uh formula one racing um so i'm so drawn into it and it's just, it's not because of the competitiveness and the race. It's the whole thing around technology, how they push the boundaries and technology, how they, the, the, the teamwork aspect of it, how the teams work together and everything they orchestrate. They do all the pit stop and changing all the tires and everything in two to three seconds, you know. Um, all of this fascinating me and fascinating to me. And um, 
I feel like it feeds the engineer and me and the, the leader and me to learn, get better on, on that aspect. So that's in a nutshell, some of these different areas that I do out of the power platform. That is incredible and incredible. Great and great diversity, a phenomenal size family. I come from a family of seven siblings, and I thought that was large, but uh, it doesn't compete with your size. So that, that's oh, hey, yeah, we got you on there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got me on yeah. there. That's for real. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about how did you get involved then ultimately in the power platform? What was that journey for you? Oh, yeah, so this is this is an uh. A fascinating story for me personally, because um, what happened is uh, during throughout my career, as a, I consider myself a career switcher. So throughout my career, I always applied my technical technology knowledge, programming and stuff and trying to build some tools and things that accelerate the work for my team, workflows, stuff like that. Fast forward, we, you know, the, the organization is adopting new tools and upgrading, you know, our um, infrastructure and the services that we have. I turn around and I see Power Apps being enabled in the organization, and uh, a community of early adopters was created. Um, it was really driven in our case from the leadership uh, down. It wasn't from the bottom up. So um, Anthony Cripps, our CTO, has this vision on on the need of that and, and really having a governance around it and model. So I happen to be one of the very early users to create an app. My first app, it t- took me about four to five hours to put together and it was phenomenal for the for the group or the team that I'm working with just because it just gives them all the visibility they need for the um, uh, what we call the slow moving inventory which is subset of an inventory that they can just look at and find easily and try to utilize so it was very very good uh, idea and then um, uh, connected with the with the community connected with the leadership a position opened, applied just like everyone else. And then I just couldn't believe it. I'm there, I'm doing it, I'm doing what I love full time. And that was where I jumped from the business side to the IT side to give it 100% of the time. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. So before we unpack what you've done in the organization, can you tell me about Baker Hughes? What does it do? I've not come across the brand in my part of the world before. Um, so a bit about that and a, and a bit about, you know, what geographies you operate in um, and the size of the organization. Yes, that's, that's a good question. So we, in Baker Hughes, we are a um, an energy technology company. So in, in our focus is taking energy forward, making it safer for, uh, you know, cleaner for people and the planet. And that's the, 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 the statement we, we put front and center for us. Um, uh, Baker Hughes originated from the oil field services originally, but the way we are today structured and what we do, we are, you know, on the all the, uh, on in different energy areas, not just oil and gas. And, and we have this commitment to the planet and, to us as people, everyone, to to deliver on the on the uh, clean energy initiatives, um, we have we are operating in over 120 countries. Wow! Um, we have uh, over um, 55,000 employees, and we have two uh, big uh, or major segments. We have the oil field services um, and, and equipment. Which, which is not just a traditional oil feed service. We do have some things that are serving, you know, in the clean energy as well, initiatives around geothermal, you know, carbon capture and utilization and storage and all of that, you know, uh, that, that will be something that will help us in, in the interim. And also we have the industri- the other uh, segment is the industrial energy and um, the in this uh, industrial energy and technology um, segment, which is um, where we have the, we are leader in the gas uh, technology, um, the LNG and, you know, for, for the end to end when it comes to the uh, gas technology and, um, you know, industrial controls to improve reliability and safety, reduce emissions and stuff like that. So we are, and then that's how we are really an energy technology company, not just focused on, certain segment of the energy sector so 
Phenomenal. So, so definitely in the enterprise when it, when it comes to size of organization, how you, you mentioned your, your CTO before <clears throat> and as vision and, and it came from the top down, which is, I love that. What was the, the rationale that you know of for even choosing the power platform? And, and what I mean here, some organizations go, you know what? We, we need to do app modernization. Some organizations say, we've got so many processes that are so disjointed. We need an orchestration to bring that together. Automation, you know, forms, data, you know, using some of the latest tech around chatbots and now, of course, AI in the mix. What really led, led your organization down the power platform path? That's an excellent question. And the, the answer may sound a little bit trivial there, but um, as part of our uh, move and upgrade of, of the tools and stuff, um, we we moved with the Microsoft 365 SKUs and it enabled Power Apps and Power Automate and everything as part of the, of the services. And the leadership, you know, took a step back and looked at it and, and, and they were thinking, okay, we have this now. We can choose to be restrictive and restrict everything. Mm-hmm. Or we can enable everything and then, you know, all kind of shadow IT and things may happen. Or we can pick a balanced approach where we can maintain the risk and governance and, and, and the benefit and provide, uh, you know, these robust tools in the hand of our um, employees across the organization to be more productive and also upscale them. So um, that's the path that the organization uh, followed and uh, when I joined, it was really focused on, bur- on 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 that aspect, building the guardrails, building this, the, the the governance models and everything to deliver on that vision. And um, there was a, a frequent um, uh, steering committee with different uh, members in the leadership to just keep them up to date on what's happening. You know, get some guidelines and also some feedback from the community as well to deliver. Um, to the leadership. So it was, and it's still happening, but it's less frequent now that we are a little bit more mature in the journey, but this is how, how it started. And it, and it, it was a, it was a great um, um, leadership direction that points us on that, on that path and enabled us uh, to deliver. Yeah. Did it start with a single app or a, an automation? Do, Do you know how it started as an, and this will lead into other questions like around, is it, do you run a centralized or a decentralized approach? Do you run a DevOps type um, operating model? Being that you're in so many countries, how do you handle the distribution of your community inside the organization? That's an excellent question because that's something I suffered with in the first few months trying to read through literature and things that are out there about, you know, governing such a such such citizen, uh, citizen development programs in general, right? Uh, if it is power platform or not, and I realized that uh, you know one of the things that I was uh, talking to my team about at some point and being kind of candid with everyone about the vision on what we're doing as a as a center of excellence is that um, our job is to basically build you know this adoption model where it, it become embedded. Uh, process across the organization, um, across different teams and, 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 and uh, you know, departments and everything to the point where if you ask me in 10 years, what is the right place for any center of excellence in any organization, it should be out. It should be done with the job. It should have been dissolved. And that becomes a standard practice across the organization. And, and um, um, believe it or not, if that's your vision, you will have a lot to do. <laughs> because mm-hmm. there's a lot of things to unpack. So um, we started with few apps. We created a small you know, community for developers on Teams. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we started building the guardrails. And the basic guardrails for any organization, if you ask me as an advice for anyone who is looking at it today, is you need to start with basically the 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 absolute necessity of controls like DLPs and stuff. These are, mm-hmm. these are you know, all documentation would point you at that. But also you need to write down yeah, what are the terms of use of this service that are internal to your organization. Uh, because every organization based on your industry or where you are 
uh, your 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 standards of data handling, your standards of of working with the platform will be different, and also building um, a code of conduct where you can uh, you know write down. Uh, I, I call it internally, kind of for uh, for just for fun. I call it our constitution nice. uh, as as a yeah. So it's the agreement between uh, the users and the COE and the whole organization that these are the expectations uh, when you work on this uh, from from A to Z and 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 that's these are the the things that propel us to keep moving forward because. In my experience, whether from my background or what I've seen in the organization or out of the community, the vast majority of citizen development developers are well-intentioned. They want to do things and they want to do it right. So, you know, these things guide them on how to do it right. And then they will follow. Uh, and and, and that's, that's where it was the building block that gave us some breathing room so that we can go back and start you know, designing the strategy and and what we need to implement for the broader organization, and and basically the decentralization from there on. Let's say somebody in your organization messages you on Teams. I take it you're using Teams, right? Yep, we do. They send you a message and say, "Muhammad, I've heard about this power platform thing. I want to build something for my department. Tell me about the journey you then take them on. Where would they look like on day zero of that communication with you to a point where you have confidence in them? They've, you know, read your constitution. Like, what is that journey? Like training, adoption? What, what does that look like for you? Yes. So that's that's actually a, a perfect scenario to walk that because there could be different approaches. One is reaching directly to me or the team. Uh, sometimes they get automatically added by their coworkers to the to the team of citizen developer community, and in some cases, because in our strategy the personal productivity is open for everyone, so they go and attempt to build something, and within 24 hours they get a welcome email from the automation of the COE that goes mm-hmm. and explain to them what to do next. So in that case, for us. The citizen developers, those who who want to become citizen developers, it has to be a conscious decision. And what does that mean is that we have a, a, a prerequisite of training that they have to do, and we are picking training from um, LinkedIn Learning. They do these, they get certified, they submit the form, and then they get into onboarding. The onboarding call is where we we move through these explain. Uh, in these virtual calls, the terms mm-hmm. of use, the code of conduct and everything, and then take them to the next environment, which we call the team productivity, where now they can build and share uh, versus impressive productivity sharing and stuff is blocked. So they, they, they are kind of bound to, you know, being, you know, around the person productivity uh, space uh, before they, they officially join the citizen development program. Do you deploy them into their own their own dev environment, as in so they've got their own dev environment that they start in, or are they landing in default? And and one other question, this is a follow on from from before. You talked about doing training on LinkedIn rather than Microsoft Learn, and I just want to understand your thinking there. Yeah, so um, the the Microsoft Learn is is great. It's reading material. LinkedIn Learning is is very well uh, curated and is video and it easily divided into chapters and they can pause and go back to it. And it happens to be accessible for our employees as part of our um, broader benefit of learning. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's available, you know, go take it, get, get to learn it, you know, in a little bit with more example and stuff in your own pace. Uh, we try our best to respect the time of, of uh, mm-hmm. all the uh, you know business users, employees, because normally this is not their primary um, task. So we cannot bring them into, let's say, a class or something to make sure that they get to learn. So they go and take that. Uh, it, it feels like it, it covers uh, broader content and because it's video-based, um, more than what you see normally and 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 learn. We advise people to go through learn and you know get certified if they would like to keep growing, but that's just an option. It's not the requirement. Yeah, yeah. Any particular course on on LinkedIn Learning? Because I think a bunch of people will be like, "Oh, I didn't even think of LinkedIn Learning as a as a as a resource." 
we go with the essentials. So there is like uh, power apps, uh, essentials, there's basics and beyond the basics, power automate basics and beyond the basics. And uh, uh, Power BI is a tricky one because the essentials of Power BI is very long. Uh, and our COE, we include Power BI. So of course. we chose to um, not require Power BI per se mm-hmm. for the, the citizen developers, but we encourage them to get these uh, trainings. Uh, there are multiple trainings like uh, uh, Power BI desktop, Power, uh, there's a, uh, there is a Power BI DAX uh, training specific, and there is as well the essentials, which is an extended one. So, um, uh, these are the the basics that we we put there as a requirement um, for the onboarding process. Yeah. How do you handle evangelism of a of new apps that get created? Is it purely word of mouth? Is it you run regular, let's say, app showcases and look what we've done? And because you know that might spark ideas in other divisions, departments with other people, teams, etc. How do you go around attracting potential would-be future makers, citizen devs um, that want to get involved? So that's an excellent question. And I will tell you, frankly, that we do not have a specific way of doing it. We do a mix of that. And it has to do with the nature of the growth that we faced. We had exponential growth in in, in our adoption journey that... Um, it didn't give us the time to sit and work with that. It seems like the word of mouth and the user experience is just smashing it and is doing wow. perfectly what it, what needs to be done. We we, uh, however, we look at those you know the use cases that stand out and we 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 showcase them to um, uh, the leadership of the functions that they are mm-hmm. part of every now and then, so that they see what's going on. Um, uh, in, the, in their areas. Um, but at the same time, from a COE perspective, we are trying to do our best to be hands-off. And, and one of the things that I keep um, talking about with my team and the rest of the organization is that we do our best to try to respect the segregation of duties. Mm-hmm. Uh, the COE has a potential of becoming an IT within IT because you can do everything. And and that that will be challenging because you will be so dependent in the COE. That's one thing. And another thing, the upscaling of the other department within your IT will become a challenge. Uh, and the business users may may be in a way higher, you know, um, skill set level because mm-hmm. as a citizen developers, they're getting there. So what we do is normally when we see cases like these we go and talk to the leaders of those departments mm-hmm. and make sure that they are aware, you know, you know, for example, you are from finance, you are from, you know, HSC or whatever department, you know, you manage all the digital tools. Here's what's going on in your area, or these are some cases, you know, uh, and what you like to do. And, 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 and with that, we had success in multiple teams that are adapted the platform to deliver um, enterprise applications uh, to the users because they've seen the capabilities and they've seen the potential of converting in some cases um, what the users are doing. And then probably this is a, a good um, point to talk about a little bit about our governance approach because what we did is we created a heat map, a risk-based governance approach. So what it is, is if you try to visualize or imagine two axes, like you have an, you have in your x-axis, in our scenario, we looked at the user base of the app. So as the user base grows between a small team into a department, into a business unit, into you know a business segment, and it you know grows. And in your in your y-axis, in the vertical axis, you look at you know the app risk for the business continuity. So is it low risk, no risk, high risk, critical? And basically we we put areas that are green zones for citizen developers, areas that are applicable for fusion development, and there are areas that are the zone that are not applicable for citizen development. And um, what's nice about this is that in an area, in citizen development in general, we practice um, reactive governance. Mm-hmm. If if you want to think about mm-hmm. it that mm-hmm. way, so you react to what the users are doing. You make sure it's it's balanced in the right way. But sometimes things grow out of the hands of of uh, the business user. They 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 create a great process. The organization loves it, 
Next day, they are presenting it to another business unit. The business unit adopts it and it keeps growing. What do we do? Um, we apply that risk-based approach. So if the app started going into the yellow zone or the red zone, this is where we we pull the stop and we go without disrupting the business, but we we take the the use case, we sit with the with the with the digital team uh, assigned uh, to the tools for that function, and we reach some sort of agreement of transfer of you know support or ownership and funding and stuff so that the continuity the business continuity is not impacted and the citizen developer is relieved as well. Because at some point, if you give them too much work, are they doing the job that they are primarily have to do? And yeah. that's where well, that's where I'm very defensive and protective of citizen developers when mm-hmm, it comes mm-hmm. to that. Uh, it, it protects the company, but it protects the talents at the same time. Yeah. Have you built an app or a dashboard that has those quadrants in it that you talked about that a app automatically by number of users you you realize it's moved into it's a uh it's a critical application for the organization number of people using it that type of thing or is it something that you're looking at your dashboards and go oops that one looks like it's moved into the yellow or um heck it's now at the point you know it could be higher you know on your on you know on the red zone you talked about what a uh, you, is it an automated thing? Have you have you automated that process, or is it is, you know what does that look like? That's a great question because you're kind of started reading in my roadmap, and I don't know if I can talk more about that. <laughs> but in in general, we are doing it somewhat manually now um, through the dashboards and reporting that we have. Uh, but the we intend uh, in our plans to you know uh, you know automate the way we're looking at it and put it into the the quadrants and everything so we can address them and and all of this has to do with um improving the functionalities of the you know in the coe starter kit there is a compliance center but it's very basic so we mm-hmm. we took it and we we are adding a lot of functionality to it and questions and stuff that will eventually automatically put things in the blocks you know when you when you have that in addition to the telemetry, you will be able to tell immediately what is happening, and um, and the teams proactively could see this dashboard um, from whatever function they are, and could take action as as they like. Um, so that's our vision when it comes to m- maturing that side. Mm-hmm. Um, again, another theme of where we're trying to be hands off, focus on infrastructure, focused on delivering the service and making sure everyone is empowered to work within their scope. There's so many questions running through my mind that I want to drill into and I can see we're at 30 minutes already. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pick, I'll, I'll, you might need to do a, a version two in, in, in a month or so time of this. You mentioned fusion teams there which tell me that it looks like you've got a digital community you know team that is bought into to do stuff at a larger scale than what a citizen dev could handle what which is quite common right as in because i see lots of scenarios where the business comes to the center of excellence and says hey we don't have any citizen developers but we're going to go out to market and buy some technology to do something you look at the requirements and go, man, that's a sweet spot for the power platform. We're already licensed. We're like, it's, it's logical to do it on the power platform. So I take it then you have a team that could understand the requirements, choose the technology set that you're going to use and build that and provide it back to the business. Is that the situation? Yeah. So that's a really good question. So we have, we have in the COE three major elements. Um, the Power Platform COE has the Citizen Development Program Manager. So this has been in the team focused on the citizen development aspect, hackathon, training, onboarding, all that. Um, feedback from the community, engagement. And then we have the Digital Operation Manager, uh, Uta, who manages um, end user support, administration, and all that focus that you need in the infrastructure side. And in my team as well, Josh manages the uh, what we call the Power Platform uh, Solution Factory. And we picked the word factory for very important reason is that we will never support anything um, as a COE team. It has to land in the right support zone. Gotcha. So as there will be cases where the business, you know, they have citizen developers and they are willing to support things, but they really don't have time to build. 
and they they have you know a budget to fund and and do it um so this is where the app the solution factory come in play spin out something quick and to do and also it sets the tone in the organization of the standard of user experience mm-hmm. and how to design application the development cycle so it becomes a it becomes a, you know a, 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 an all in all good practice because you are building that culture now this is the coe model we are now working on expanding that model on what we call the operation hubs which is in different segments and areas, if they are willing to adapt this franchise or this approach as this federated model, they can go ahead and do the same structure. And then they will follow the COE guidance. We work with them closely in, on what they need to do and work with. And um, this is why today our our successful fusion story so far is the um, is done with, with uh, one of the the digital technology unit of, of the another business segment is not the COE. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, we tell them, you know, there are different ways to do fusion. It's not necessarily that you are building or doing something. So in the, in the case that we have is they basically focused on bringing data from uh, one of the ERP instances to Dataverse and have the citizen developers from there, you know, for example, build automation around uh, PO headers or something or integrate them in a workflow or whatever. So the job of that kind of fusion is, hey, we are the data stewards. We'll give you the data. We'll make sure it's accurate. We'll make sure it's consistent. And you build whatever you want with it as long as you, you know you are part of that unit and you can access it. So um, that's that's where we want. We don't want to tell people how to do it. We would rather see the creativity of every team on how they want to build their own fusion based on on the, the function or the needs in, in different segments. So, I love it. Mohammed, we're out of time. I feel we will do a follow-up if you're, if you're interested. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you. This has been great. And yeah, there is a lot to unpack and we'll look forward to talk to you again. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365guy. Stay safe out there and shoot for the stars.